Hello. Welcome to Medusa Was Framed. My name is Joyce, and you will soon be able to find more of my work at ungurulife.com, a private business club of independent researchers, educators, and lifestyle facilitators. www.ungurulife.com. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Buffy. These gentlemen here. My experience with them is they are listed as the people that built this, the Ponce de Leon Hotel. And this, the Flagler Memorial Presbyterian Church. And this, the Methodist Memorial Church. And then the Alcazar Hotel. All properties at one time of Henry Flagler, John Mervan Carrer and Thomas Hastings. May be best known outside of St. Augustine as the architects that designed the New York Public Library. Both of these gentlemen attended the Ecole des Beaux Arts in Paris. Education here was set in the atelier system where you don't sit in a classroom but you, in essence, commission to apprentice to a master, and then you are in workshop processes with them. They were both at the Ecole de Beaux Arts at similarly same times, not exactly the same times, but their times there overlapped. They were not in the same atiers, but managed to bump shoulders at some point, nonetheless. Upon graduation, both ended up back in New York City. The regions from which they came and both succeeded in going to work for what was then the most famous, noteworthy, dynamic, architectural firm in New York, if not the known world at the time. McKim, Mead, and White. Considered the Gilded Age architectural firm. During the time that Carrere and Hastings were working for them, they accomplished these things. Most notably, perhaps, being this right here, the original Pennsylvania station in New York City. Also the Brooklyn Museum, pictured here. The main campus of Columbia University in New York City. The Boston Public Library, which you see here. Rhode Island State House, Roosevelt Hall at Fort McNair. So these boys, fresh from their education in Paris, got to have their drafting hands. It's some pretty impressive stuff. But let's talk about the men who shaped their early career. Let's talk about Charles Follen McKeon. Charles was the son of a Quaker abolitionist, which as you may rec recall, if you've seen my earlier videos, was also the story of Mr. White, Franklin White, who is noted for building the Via Zorada here in St. Augustine, also the Casa Monica, here in St. Augustine, but most notably known for the man who had drafted a plan to redesign DC. He was also the son of a Quaker abolitionist. Hmm. We'll just leave that there. Mr. McKim was raised in New Jersey. He attended Harvard, Skull and Bones, and he too attended the Ecole de Beaux. 
Next in line is William Rutherford Mead. He was known as the center of the office. A man who, even though he was crafted in architecture, found that his talents were better served to the organization and administration of getting it all done instead of the creative talent itself. Mr. Mead was born in Vermont. He was the cousin of President Rutherford B. Hayes, that being the reason for his middle name. He attended Amherst and was part of the construction of the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. He apprenticed with the gentleman, Russell Sturgis, who is attributed with designing the Met. In 1872, he partnered with Charles McKim, making McKim and Mead. Lastly, we have Stanford White, who was murdered in 1906 at Madison Square Theater before the modern construction of Madison Square Garden, there was Madison Square Theater. He was on the roof in the rooftop bar and he was murdered there at the age of 53. Mr. White was the son of a dandy intellectual artist fluttering around the New York art world, not a man known for bringing in much money to his suffering family, but did make significant connections in the art and creative world. Most primarily that of Jean Lafarge, who was an author, designer, and illustrator. Louis Comfort Timpany, who we know by his glass works, and Frederick Law Olmsted, the infamous landscape designer. Mr. White had no architectural training, but was very well connected. And via his connections, he was able to apprentice to none other than Henry Hobson Richardson. A talented boy from New Orleans. The man who created Richardson Romanesque or so we are to believe, thought to be the greatest American architect of the day, recognized as the trinity of American architects, that being Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, and he himself, Henry Hobson Richardson. While White was in apprenticeship with Mr. Richardson, he had the opportunity to partake in the alleged construction of Boston Trinity Church. Now White had a reputation of enjoying the company of very young women. And the man behind the gun that took his life on the roof of Madison Square Theater was the then husband of a young woman who had been, hmm, how do we say this? Part of Stanford White's attention since she was 15. She was now married to this gentleman, but suggestion, rumor, suspicion was that dalliances were still occurring. And so this man showed up 
and took his life. So there, now you understand a bit about the trilogy. Our young boys from Paris return with their Beaux Arts education, Mr. Carrere and Mr. Hastings, and they're taken under the wings of McKim, Mead, and White in 1883. During this time, they had the opportunity to be involved in the following constructions. The original Madison Square Garden, which was a mixed use property, retail, apartment, and a restaurant and bar on top, interestingly enough, where Stanford White lived when he was shot in 1906 and the very restaurant in which he was shot. He designed the place where he died. Also, the original Pennsylvania station. The National Museum of American History. These are three pretty big project for young boy, fresh from school. After just a few years working for the big guns, they decided to start their own architecture firm together and broke out on their own in 1885. Mr. Hastings came from a family of Presbyterian ministers. His grandfather is reputed with writing the hymn Rock of Ages. A regular parishioner in his father's church had been looking for a remodel for his home on Long Island and expressed an interest to Mr. Hastings' father. Well, his father informed Henry Flagler that his son had just returned from France and the Beaux Arts. And for whatever reason, how things happen, that same year, the year they started their own practice, Hastings won the bid to expand the library at Henry Flagler's Long Island home, Mamaroneck Estate. Pleased with the work, Mr. Flagler is said to have reached out and asked Hastings to come back and build him a hotel, this time with his partner, John Perez. Allegedly, construction of the Ponce de Leon Hotel started in 1885 and was completed in 1887, 270,000 square feet, 600 rooms. A feat that required Flagler hiring 1,100 recently liberated slaves to be trained in construction. Flagler owned this town at the time and for a time after, more ways than one with that Rockefeller Standard Oil money. And as a gift to the city that he was completely revamping, he hired Carrere and Hastings to again build a new church. The Grace United Methodist Church was said to have begun in 1886 and finished in 1887. So we are to believe that in a period of time, not long after the Civil War, two grand structures were being built in war-torn Florida. 
St. Augustine was the capital of Florida at the time. Now, if that's not enough, Flagler complained that the influx of tourists for winters in St. Augustine was so extreme that he needed another hotel. And before the Ponce de Leon was even completed, he started construction of the hotel, which sits across the street to this day, then called the Alcazar, now referred to as the Leitner Museum. So the Alcazar was said to have been started while the Ponce de Leon was under construction in 1887 and finished in 1888. Again, let's not question resources and various materials that would have needed to have gone into doing these things, not to mention the fact that both the Ponce de Leon and the Alcazar sit on a creek. There's a creek there. They had to fill in the creek, shore it up, reinforce it and build these massive hotels that had Turkish baths, heated pools, and multiple stories. Sure, you believe that, don't you? Well, that's not enough. In 1889, Flagler had again completed through the craftsmanship of Carrera, the Memorial Presbyterian Church, which we are to believe was built in one year's time as an honorarium to his daughter who had died while giving birth to his granddaughter. It just so happens that Flagler is also buried in the Memorial Presbyterian Church. He passed away in 1913, happily in his 80s. But 1889, 1888 to 1889, so while the Alcazar Hotel was being finished, construction was to have started here on the Presbyterian Church and finished in one year with the family tomb inside. First entry in the tomb, his daughter and granddaughter. Busy, busy commissions for young architects. In 1893, Kirkside, Flagler's St. Augustine home, was also built, we are told, by Carrera and Hastings. This house no longer stands. So there is a marker on the street where it did. So these fancy schmancy hotels really got these guys noticed. It hadn't made them yet, but it got them noticed. And their fame started to grow. In 1891, we are to believe, they designed and built the Commonwealth Club. Also in 1891, the Edison Building, also. In 1892, they accomplished the New York Evening Mail. Also in 1892, Brookside Park in Terrytown, New York, upstate, the Sleepy Hollow Park. Interesting, that culvert, that water, system. I thought engineers, which is a different training and understanding, built canals and culverts and bridges. And yet, Brookside Park is full of both water systems and bridges. In 1895, they reputedly built the original 
Jefferson Hotel in Richmond, Virginia. You can see it's obviously been modernized, but you see the original flavor. In 1896, they were commissioned to build the Cairnwood Mansion in Bryn Athern, Pennsylvania. Also in 1896, they managed to spit out the Patterson, New Jersey City Hall. In 1997, they started the New York Public Library. And this was the job that made them. If they hadn't already sealed the deal, this was the deal that sealed them. Now, moving on to no doubt to Henry Flagler and his friends of the mansion world, they received the commission for the Burnwood Estate, one of the Gold Coast mansions. This was the home of Walter Jennings. Long Island, New York. Following that, between 1898 and 1900, they accomplished the Cosmos Club. Well, it's called the Cosmos Club now. It was the commissioned home of a gentleman by the name of Townsend at the time. In 1896, they accomplished Vernon Court in Rhode Island, New Jersey. These guys are prolific, aren't they? In 1998, they accomplished Blairsden, the Blair home in Peapack, New York. Lots of mansions. 1899, Foster was added to their list. 1901, they accomplished what was then known as Hamilton Fish Park. In 1901, their buddy Henry Flagler called them back to Florida to build what became his primary home, Whitehall, in Palm Beach. Next, they were back up to the east, where also in 1901, they accomplished Woolsey Hall, part of the Hewitt Quad building at Yale. Something else was happening in 1901. Buffalo had a World's Fair, the Pan American Exhibition. Now, they didn't build a building or an attraction at the fair, but Carrer, had the unusual honor of being the lead architect for the entire fair. He and Thomas Hastings both by that point being noted members of the American Institute of Architects, various art leagues throughout New York and impressive political connections. So well, that's a big job, Monsieur Kair, being a lead architect for the entire fair, kind of like Berman for the White City. 1902, they accomplished the Blair Building. And in 1903, we're part of the building of the original Metropolitan Opera House. They designed the interiors. Isn't that interesting? Well, you know, now, Carrer grew up artistically. Hastings was interested in design, but his early training, his boyhood training, was actually in, in interior design, furniture making, woodworking. If we are to believe that this is true, that these gentlemen in fact did 
take on this task, if they did have a hand in the design of the interior, one would think that it was more of Hastings and and careers. But you can't go small when you are a reset architect. You can't go small. You always have to be out doing so. So while they were finishing up the interior of the Met, they started design for the Russell Senate building in DC. That's kind of spread thin, don't you think? That we are told took five years. However, only a year after they started the Russell Senate office building, they were working on Smith and Rockefeller Hall at Cornell. And also in 1904, accomplished the first, Christ, first church Christ scientist at the corner of 96th Street in New York City. Looks like Hastings was again using some of his interior design skills there. 1905, they were commissioned to build the Whitney Squash Court at the Aiken Winter Colony in Aiken, South Carolina. 1905, they were up in Toronto building this. 1906, Richmond Hall. Year later, they accomplished Arden, Harrison, New York, home of a man by the name of Harriman. In 1907, and after the fateful murder of President McKinley at the Buffalo World's Fair, they were contracted by the city of Buffalo to build the McKinley Monument, which stands in front of City Hall. 1908 had them working on the Cheney Bazell Mansion, which is now the Massachusetts Historical Society in Dover, Massachusetts. 1908. They worked together to complete a bagatelle, Thomas Hastings' home in New York. 1909, again with these theaters, again with this interior design, Mr. Hastings, they completed the Century Theater, Hastings and his interior design skills. 1909 to 1910, they were working on Nemours, the home of the DuPont family in Williamton, Delaware. 1909 to 1911, they worked on an estate in Scopus, New York, Colonel Oliver Payne's estate. During that time, they were working on yet another theater, yet another theater, the Lunt Fontaine, while they were building the Payne Estate. And again, in the premise of you got to keep going big when you're a reset architect, in one year, and while they were working on the Lunt Fontaine Theater, we are to believe that they built the approaches to the Manhattan Bridge in New York City. Hmm. During this time, during the construction of the Lunt Fontaine Theater, and the Manhattan approaches to the bridge, they were working on the Carnegie Institution of Administration in Washington, D.C. In 1911, Carrere was in a taxi returning from a dinner meeting. 
His taxi tried to dodge a streetcar and failed. The taxi was overturned. It was March 1st. He suffered severe head injuries. 17 days later, he died. He was 52. These were the darlings of the time. There was a full page ad in the New York Times announcing his death. 2,000 people attended his funeral. There is an honorarium to him, a plaque on a staircase at 97th Street in Riverside Park, made of pink granite, designed by Thomas Hastings for his former partner. Carrere had been elected to the American Institute of Architects in 1891, served as president twice, and remained in the association until his death. He was a key member of the board of the United States National Sculpture Society. He was twice president of the New York City Society of Beaux Arts Architects, chairman of the board of architects for the Pan American Exhibition in 1901, member of the Architectural League of New York, member of the National Institute of Arts and Letters and New York Arts Commission. He passed away two months before the New York Public Library opened. His casket was laid in state in the rotunda and that portion of the library opened for public viewing of the casket after his death. He was finally laid to rest in the family plot in Silver Mount Cemetery, Sunnyside, Staten Island. Carrer had actually been born in Rio de Janeiro. His father, a well-to-do American merchant his mother, Brazilian, a bust of career sits within the New York Public Library, as does one now of Hastings. Hastings continued without his partner. In 1912, Hastings and his new team completed the Banger Savings Bank in Bangor, Maine. Portland City Hall in Portland, Maine was also completed in 2012. Three Times a Charm also completed in 1912 was the U.S. Rubber Company in New York City. Back up the road to Canada, the short trip to Toronto brought them back to the Bank of Toronto to complete the head office in 1913. 1914, they were back in New York to complete the Henry Clay Frick House, which now holds the Frick Collection, 70th Street in New York City. Also in 1914, the William Stanley Mellon House, which is also now a gallery. 1914, the Sydney Lanier Monument. And while the entire world was running around and enjoying world's fairs and the beauty of reset architecture and mud floods and grandiosity, through his connections to people like Olmsted, Berman, Richardson, Hastings was asked to submit something for the Pan Pacific exhibition in San Francisco in 1950. 
His contribution, we are to believe, was the famous Tower of Jewels, a 435 foot tower finished in 100,000 pieces of cut stained glass, reflecting light during the day and illuminated by 50 electrical searchlights at night. The Pan Pacific ran from February to December of 1915. Wasn't there a war going on? Well, while he was on the West Coast, he went ahead in the same year as the Pan Pacific Exhibition and finished the Pocatello Railroad Yard in Pocatello, Idaho. Then he scooted back within the same year to DC to accomplish the first statue on the ellipse, the Brett Millet Memorial Fountain, busy during World War I. New York City's Grand Army Plaza Arch was finished in 2016. The Pulitzer Fountain in New York City also finished in 1916. The Dividend Hill Pavilion in Newark, New Jersey, also in 2016. And not to be finished with 2016 yet was the Cotton Chapel at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania. 2017, he completed Cumier Chapel at Western College, also known as New Miami University, civil rights minded individuals were working to help register black folks in Mississippi who due to local legislation and poll taxes could not get registered to vote. That's actually going to be an upcoming video as well, all about this. And it is through this one that I learned. Also in 1917, back in DC, the Hotel Washington. This one seems to have taken a bit longer, but in 1920, he is noted for finishing the Arlington Memorial Amphitheater at Arlington Cemetery. Quite varied in his skill set, yes. He can construct fountains, he can construct homes, he can construct elaborate colonnades and amphitheaters, culverts and bridges. 1921, he finished the Cunard Building. 1925, he was back on the West Coast, back in Idaho, this time to finish the Boise Railroad Yard. Headed back to New York, 1926, finished the Standard Oil Building because he knew Rockefeller through Flagler. 1929, he was in Kentucky where he built the Louisville War Memorial. Back to DC, same year, 1929, for the Embassy of Laos. In 1929, October, Mr. Hastings was admitted to Nassau Hospital in Mineola, Long Island, for what turned out to be appendicitis. There were complications during the surgery infection, and he passed during the surgery. He was 69. 
He is buried in Putnam Cemetery in Greenwich, Connecticut. Unlike his partner, John Carrer, this reverend family wanted a simple service. was done in the seminary where his father and grandfather had been ordained, Union Seminary, by the president at the time, Dr. Henry Sloan Coffin. Hmm. Dr. Coffin presided over service. Hastings had been a founding member of the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts, and that is another story in itself. I amassed a great deal of notes just on that and the political dirt involved in that, much of it being opposition to votes for women, much of it being anti-abolitionist, This was dirty. 1906, he was elected to the National Academy of Design, a position he held until his death. And his bust, as mentioned, is also now in the New York Public Library. It was constructed by artist Fredrick McMorris. The drawings of Carrere and Hastings are in permanent collection at the Avery Library at Columbia. If Thomas Hastings is known for one construction alone, it would be the tomb of the unknown soldier. Though perhaps not as grand as the amphitheater, it is certainly the most well-known. Inheritors, inheritors, they were without a doubt. Henry Flagler writes that his commission for the Ponce de Leon Hotel here in St. Augustine was the first of 600 commissions that became noted to Carrere in Hastings. I did not even scratch the surface here. 600. In a period of time that amassed one depression, the Great Scare of 1893, and a war, and yet they accomplished this grandiose. Their collective memory to most people will be summed up in the New York Public Library, but their local impact will be seen in mansions or here in St. Augustine, they're known as Henry Flagler's architects. Do you think these two gentlemen really accomplished all of this? Taking into consideration access to materials, access to labor, transportation of materials. What about World War I? How on earth? Were they building massive homes, mansions, banks? And how did a country at war accomplish more than one world's fair? Carrera and Hastings have certainly left an impact on the architectural world. I want to thank you for spending time with me today. I want to thank Michelle. Melanie and Buffy, my sisters at Hunguru, for all your support. 
This is a very grateful choice that Medusa was framed. Thanking you for your comments, your likes, your subscriptions, your coffees, your memberships, and taking the time to listen to my quirky, irreverent presentations. Thank you so very much.